Well, let's get started with our first panel this morning, which is space and materiality um, of tabletop and analog gaming. Um, I'm the moderator and host, uh, Evan Torner, and I'm an associate professor of German and film and media studies at the University of Cincinnati. Um, each uh, speaker in turn will, will be announced by me and, and we'll get 15 minutes. And of course we do moderate quite strictly in order to give uh, full time to everybody possible. Um, if you have a question, uh, please, uh, if you, and you're a participant in, in the webinar and have a question, please put it in the q and I will see it. And um, if there is after discussion about the panel, we encourage you to go to the Discord, which you'll have gotten an invite in your Eventbrite link, and um, and hold that discussion there um, in text. And uh, this, this of course, uh, this YouTube video is, is available in posterity um, as well. And, and so uh, we're going to try and keep the, the conversation moving along with the participants. Uh, everyone is here and that that's wonderful. Um, I will then welcome our first speaker who, uh, Kellen, who uh, you can already start setting up your slides and to see if that, that works. Um, and I will say this is uh, Kellen Wee from the University of College uh, uh, London. Uh, a point of organizational note, you'll notice that we have a lot of European speakers this morning. That is because it's not morning there, it's afternoon. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and that is an, also an organizing principle. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Kellen to the floor. And uh, we very much look forward to hearing about role-playing studio spaces. Sorry, I had some trouble unmuting myself. Okay, um, I'm hoping you can all hear me and see me and everything is technically all right. Um, I see nods and thumbs up, so I will go ahead. All right, um, so thank you all so much for joining me for my talk today. And thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and accepting the paper that I submitted. Um, the title of my talk is, I like the dragon to be there role-playing studio spaces and the delivery of the paid game experience in Singapore. So this particular talk draws from ongoing research about tabletop role-playing games in Singapore um, that focuses on play, speculation and contingency in play cultures here. And this specific presentation focuses on how material environments created by TTRPG studios stage atmospheres that position players as faithful agents and central characters. And this is a response really to cultures of play in Singapore, which have been transformed by actual play shows such as Critical Role. So the expansion of the player base as well as the need to scaffold the experience for new players um, in, for games like D&D have resulted in these material constitutions. So because I think that most um, RPG research has focused in a more Anglo-American context, I would like to briefly introduce Singapore to all of you. Um, and maybe this is not a very flattering portrayal, but uh, in my defense, I am Singaporean, so I'm allowed to say these things. Uh, Singapore is, we are a very small island nation. We've only got 6 million people here. Um, we were colonized by the British, which is why I'm speaking English. And um, we are a very highly developed sort of economic powerhouse country. That said, uh, state formation in Singapore has been marked by narratives of crisis. So the crisis of decolonization, the crisis of separation from Malaysia, the crisis of state security, the crisis of economic vulnerability. And this has been combined with um, very little room for play in terms of the pressures and cultures that children grow up in. So you've got narratives of crisis and you've got intense school pressures that uh, children face. So for example, we are third in terms of most time in the world spent on homework. Um, there are high levels of anxiety that students face. And our lives in general are powerfully orchestrated by the state. So for example, access to public housing is something that is very state controlled and open mostly to nuclear um, street families. Uh, you've also got things like conscription, which um, is a mandatory rite of passage for men within the country. So the hand of the state in our lives is very heavy. And it means that uh, spaces and narratives of play are curtailed or made smaller. So this is just sort of the context and overview of um, cultures of play here, which in general are not, people are not very familiar with, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, people are not very familiar with um, 
playfulness and it is a muscle that needs to be that needs to be strengthened. All right, so one way in which um, play cultures have changed and the way that it has materialized is in the way that public sites of play have been transformed. So uh, the usual sites of play in the past, which began in the 1980s, so despite all this, we do still play D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, right? So sites of play in the past tend to have been attached to more retail spaces. So you've got comic book shops or game shops that host D&D games, you know, on weekends perhaps. And these would be, uh, these would be events that are held on you know, multiple tables and a shared shop, shared, shared shop space, little to no usage of music, mostly um, drop-in, drop-out games that are focused on combat, and they would be fairly cheap, so you'd pay 5 to $7 to play a game. Um, things have changed, so beginning from the 2020s, when after the pandemic swept through the country or through the world, really, um, there have been the development of game studios, and these are really spaces of experience. So I'm just going to play like a little clip on the side and I'll keep talking as it goes. But you can see that these are very elaborate material setups um, that include provision to all kinds of physical assets and objects. But there's also things like blackout curtains, mood lighting, sound effects, um, you know, elaborate kind of panels where you can control what kind of music is playing, even starlight projections, pop machines and uh, smart lights that have different hues and colors that help create a particular kind of environment. So the development of these particular studios is quite new. It's actually very new um, and concomitant to this change. There has also been an increase in the price of a D&D experience, which is what uh, these studios now sell, I guess, these, these games as. Um, you could pay $20 to up to $50 for a game, which is a huge jump from what games were priced at in the past. Um, some work, okay, this is also a video of some very shiny dice that I saw, but some work on materializing tabletop role-playing games that I want to um, give credit to include Rafael Biena's work, which has focused on actor network theory, uh, which takes objects and entities to be on the same kind of actors in the field as people, right? So you would have entities that interact with each other to stabilize the field. And in general, this turn or this attention to the material, I think is a big change from the way that we have looked at role-playing games in the past, which has um, rightly, I suppose, focused on talk, right? So utterances, shared world creation, and how people converse at the table, which is a very interesting and rich arena of study. But I think looking at the material, which is what this conference does, is also really interesting. And especially with the turn towards the digital and playing games face-to-face, -face, we have seen more attention paid to the analog components of tabletop role-playing games. So you've got work that looks at people who cling to the tactility of a game, um, the sound of the dice as it rolls, uh, the archival nature of a character sheet, which is you know, thin with like eraser rubbing and so on or the multi-material assemblages that make uh, a character. So you've got character sheets, but also character portraits or backstories. These are all things that we are looking at in the field. Um, some things that I want to look at in this particular paper are, are actually two things that are perhaps less material, which is sound and lighting. Uh, this is a screenshot of a panel from Sirenscape, which sort of adjusts music and ambient sound. And there have been authors that have looked at sound um, as a kind of way of creating an oral actuality or how sound works with our bodies to create various layers of um, oral environments that affect the game. Something else that I think hasn't been looked at, and this is a picture of some of my friends uh, who have installed these smart lights to create really cool lighting effects in, in games, for games. Um, something else that I think we haven't really looked at, and perhaps this is because smart lighting only became uh, popular or more widely available in the past few years, is how light works in games to, to create particular kinds of environments. Um, the work that I draw from comes from anthropology, so how lighting practices are culturally situated, but I will, I will just speed on from here because I'm just want to be mindful of time. So the sort of uh, concept that I have found really useful for understanding how sound and light play into the more conventional material components of a game is this idea of an atmosphere, which is a sort of a fuzzy concept to suit its you know, fuzzy conceptualization. Um, it is, I think atmospheres, uh, as it has been thought of, are sort of sensory emotional vibes, I suppose, a combination of subjective experience and material environment. So things like lighting and sound smudge between the material and immaterial. And interestingly, I think they can also be staged by material environments. And here is the point where um, I talk about what it's like to play a game at one of these studios. 
And if I could transplant all of you into a studio and make you play a game with me, that would be the ideal way of conveying this experience, but I can't. So the best I can do is to read out loud what it would be like to, to play here. And I think um, what I want to draw your attention to is how important a role sound and light um, play in this particular conveyance of a fateful moment within the game. So a DM turns to the player and asks, what do you do next? The intent focus on a DM's face is illuminated by the upturned screen that beams information up at him as he stands at the head of the table. Behind him, blackout curtains block out the blistering Singapore sun. Pushed from surround sound speakers, music pulsates through the room, a low cicada-like keening emanating from tense orchestral strings. The lights are set to a dim wash of colour, illuminating five of us sitting at the table in plush chairs in a moody gauze, while spotlights make our character sheets and dice trays more visible. Between all of us is this elaborate setup, a model windmill made out of foam and resin and plastic. And inside this windmill is, well, us, five miniature people um, around which are scattered our enemy combatants. The player says, um, I cast Eldritch Blast, which is a spell in the game. He reaches for dice. We didn't have to bring our own. The studio provides it for us, then rolls to see if his character successfully hits. He does some math and says a number. Instead of saying or resolving that problem, the DM turns to him and says, what color do you imagine your Eldritch Blast to be? And the player thinks for all and says, um, I see blue. There's a suspension in the air. The DM's hand sweeps across the console and the room is suddenly lit with a flare of icy blue light. There is a crashing sound of impact, some sorcerous bolt finding its mark, ricocheting around our heads. We recognize this sound from countless computer games and movies, a swoosh of something fiery racing through the air, and then the crackle of impact like lightning hitting pavements. The DM's hand moves across the console again, and the music swells to a victorious march. It hits, the DM cries, his voice punching the room. You see Baralt's shadow being raise a palm, lightning gathers in the falling rain, and then an icy blue bolt flies through the window and hits the coffice straight in the chest. As the music crescendos, we all stop for a moment and then break out into a cheer. And as the denouement of the story um, takes place, you feel the music sort of softening into a contemplative mood, and the dim light becomes a warm wash. So here you can see that this incredibly elaborate environment is um, a way of linking sound and image to connote a sense of storytelling. It offers a common or popular visual vocabulary for new players to understand what it is like to, to play a game. So this setup has been engineered to create this very instant where the drama of the killing blow is conjured through the lighting, the oral vocabulary, um, of cinema, and it unfolds almost like a film shot in slow motion, an easy hook to hang our imagination on. So the material and aesthetic constitution of this studio is deliberately designed to enhance immersion in this way, to make you feel like you are a faithful agent, a main character in the story. Um, on top of that, the studio also offers material specificities. So at one point, the DM narrates, um, pulling out a note, a crumpled note from a rope pocket. And as he narrates this, he reaches into a trolley next to him and pulls out a crumpled note, hands it to us. And of course, we all, you know, heads like gather in the middle of the table, unfold it and gasp because in this note are our characters' names. Um, and the story is that we have been framed for assassination. So this moment of particularity that it is our characters that the story hangs on, that we are um, not just watching a movie, but also in the middle of it, the stars of the movie, is created through these props, these uh, sound effects, these lighting effects. Um, yes. So what this does is really an act to signal to new players to d and the genre expectations, but also the agential possibilities of the game. So when you connect uh, sound and light and the storytelling together, you do understand the genre of D&D as is expected to be in the studio, that of heroic fantasy but also the agential possibilities, like inviting new players to think of themselves as heroes. But on top of visibilizing new players, um, the studio also conceals new players, and it is this concealment that allows them to step forward and play. 
Um, and again, this ties to the fact that it is commonly said within, uh, you know, these, it is commonly said within the community that the imaginative muscle is weak, right? That people are not accustomed to storytelling. Um, and what the studio owner tells me is that he compares the sound to a blanket rather than, uh, you know, like an orchestra that, that, that underscores a musical, right? The lights is like privacy sheets on a window. It lets you do what you want to do in this room or like in your room, like a bedroom. Without a setup like this, I would struggle. There's a barrier. I have to think before I do. And here, I don't want people to think. So having all these um, effects press in on you, the blackout curtains concealing light, the, 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 the sound that conceals your perhaps crunching on chips or other ambient sounds within the environment, it excerpts you from the flow of everyday life and places you in this studio and allows you to think of role-playing as unmasking. So Demet continues and says, you may say that the lights and all that help players to step outside of themselves, but actually I want players to step inside of themselves. Um, they get to be them. So rather than role-playing, it is see, rather than playing a role, um, what these studios aim to do is to allow players to access a certain sense of authenticity. Uh, you wear a mask with your colleagues and sad to say, sometimes even with your loved ones. And here, they can just be childish. So what we see here, and this is just a small part of the free work, is that you see the game changing from just a game to an experience. Okay, I see one minute remaining. Um, so what happens is that, oh, I was discombobulated. Okay, so what happens is that rather than thinking of it as a game, you think of it as uh, a moment in which you are the faithful agent that tells the story, right? And I think what this offers game studies or what we can think about in terms of what this um, adds to our work is when we think of collusions of chance of fateful moments, we often think of it in, in the flow of a long-term gameplay where narrative payoff and the dice collude to create these gaming stories, these fateful moments. But what happens when an environment is staged to try and draw out these moments so that players keep coming back? Um, and these are some of the questions that I think this sort of work allows us to ask. So how are local play cultures transmitted, taught and learned? What do we view as story-worthy or story-like? Is it always to be cinematic where you are the main character in a fateful place? How do players themselves experience these atmospheres? And I can't see the last one because I've blocked myself, but what distributed creative practices emerge from these environments? So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kellen. And please, uh, everyone, uh, give a round of applause in the emojis. Uh, I have a few, few more um, technical issues to to announce as we are uh, transitioning to our next panel. Uh, first of all, Kellen, you may stop sharing your screen if you'd like. And and again, this is like I really hated to even cut you off because I was so enraptured with what you were saying. <laughs> uh, but the the um, you know all that aside, uh, all questions will be uh, held f um, until till the end of the panel, not after the speaker. Which means that if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A now. We'll catch it later on and make sure that we know it's a, it's a question for Kellen. Uh, the the second um, uh, point of order is that um that it, it, we are recording all of the presentations but literally everybody uh has the right to opt out of the final video recording which means if one panel says a panelist says no i'd rather this was not put on youtube later on then they may withdraw that uh that consent and, and so it's, it's no problem and then from there we are um we, we are good to go with our next presenter dr alexandra kviat at the University of Leicester with public board gaming in the post-pandemic UK. Uh, so uh, let's let's give a round of applause again for Alexandra Kiviat. Hi, hello everyone. Um, can you hear me? It's, yes, it's, we can. Oh yeah, great, great. Because I don't see, I only see my presentation right now. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and. Um, my presentation is called Public Board Gaming in the Post-Pandemic UK, Ambiences and Audiences. And I think it's going to echo a lot of things uh, that have been mentioned by Kaleen, but in a slightly different context, because it's going to be about board games. Um, but this link between ambiences and audiences, I think, is what uh, we share in our interests. Uh, so before I begin, I have to make a confession. I'm not so much of a gamer myself. Uh, but I'm definitely board games curious. 
Um, and I approach board gaming from maybe a slightly unusual angle because my background is not in game studies. It's um, in the sociology of space, place, and consumption. Um, and the study I'm currently working on explores how um, board game and spaces, which includes cafes, bars, shops, community centers, and pretty much everything else that is in someone's home or workspace, uh, how they make board gaming uh, more acceptable, appealing, um, and accessible, and how they help build, com build communities at a time of social isolation. Uh, so everything I will be talking about today is very much work in progress because I'm still uh, doing my field work. So at this point, I can only share some preliminary uh, emerging findings. Um, I'm using in-depth qualitative interviews with gamers, including both serious and I'm especially interested in casual light gamers, uh, business owners and staff, uh, and people who organize meetups um, from across the UK. Uh, I've got 35 participants so far, um, half of them female, half male, and I hope to do some more interviews in the next couple of months. I also use ethnographic participant observations in various geographic locations from cities to towns and villages. Um, so a few words about the UK context. Over the past six, seven years, there's been a lot of media buzz about um, the board games market boom. And this boom is associated, among other things, with the emergence of new gaming spaces. Uh, and there is a very common narrative, both in the media and in my interviews, uh, describing how board games metaphorically and literally came out of private, secluded, and marginal spaces, such as basements and back rooms, into the public space. Uh, but two years ago, um, this process was interrupted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the 16 months of national lockdowns and restrictions on business activities and socializing may have increased um, the sales of board games, but only for domestic consumption, whereas public board gaming was a no-go at least um, until last July. And with the ongoing Omicron concerns, uh, a lot of people are still cautious about playing board games in a public place with strangers. Um, nevertheless, the UK's public board gaming scene is incredibly diverse and it keeps growing. Uh, people are playing board games in very different spaces, including specialized and non-specialized and commercial and non-commercial ones. Um, specialized commercial spaces uh, include not only dedicated board game cafes and bars used on a day-to-day -day basis, but also temporary spaces such as convention halls that turn into board gaming spaces once a year, and B&Bs and campsites uh, that offer board gaming holidays. Specialized non-commercial uh, spaces such as community board game cafes are a more recent experimental thing, and I know at least one that is going to open soon. Apart from that, uh, board game enthusiasts organize regular gaming meetups that take place weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly uh, in non-specialized spaces, including commercial, such as pubs and cafes, and non-commercial ones, community centers, sports centers, libraries, church halls, um, village halls. And what I'm trying to find out in my study is how these multiple diverse environments are constructed physically and socially, and how they um, affect gaming atmospheres, interactions, and experiences, and also how these complex socio-spatial um, ambiences may include or exclude different audiences. Uh, I approach board gaming as a specialized practice produced through the continuous interplay between uh, the three dimensions of space, identified by sociologist and philosopher of space, and really Fever, um, conceived or envisioned space, perceived or interpreted space, and lived or experienced space. So to put it briefly, the same physical space can be envisioned, uh, interpreted, and experienced in many different and sometimes conflicting ways by different people. Um, the vast majority of um, business owners and gaming meetup organizers are looking to create a space they describe as accessible, friendly, approachable, um, comfortable, uh, something that is open to all, some, somewhere where, is, where everyone is welcome, 
But uh, first, the idea of what is accessible, friendly, and comfortable is shaped by their own experiences and perceptions. And second, it may not be interpreted or experienced as accessible, friendly, and comfortable by everyone else. Um, in my study, I have ident identified um, the key elements or factors that shape public board gaming environments, and they include type of space, location and time, layout and design, hosting, games and gamers, and food and drinks. Um, although um, there are many different types of public board gaming spaces, there are three of them that are mentioned most frequently and uh, typically in relation to one another, game shops, dedicated board game cafes, and meetups in commercial and non-commercial venues. And there are three key dialectics uh, that typically come up whenever these three types of spaces are discussed in the interviews. Exclusion versus inclusion, niche versus mainstream, and non-commercial versus commercial. Um, game shops are probably um, the oldest type of public board game in space, and almost everyone I talk to describe them as um, very exclusive, hostile, intimidating, uh, male-dominated spaces where women and everyone else who doesn't look like, as one participant put it, an actual gamer, um, feel like they are not going. They feel like they are going to be judged, uh, interrogated, and overall unwelcome. Uh, for meetup organizers and board game cafe owners, game shops represent uh, the opposite of the atmosphere that they want to create. But when it comes to differences between um, meetups and board game cafes in terms of their inclusivity, things become a bit more complex. So uh, meetup organizers often emphasize that meetups are more open to people without company, whereas board game cafes operate on a bring your own friend principle. At the same time, even those people uh, who prefer meetups to board game cafes uh, admit that meetup environments can be clicky. Um, for others, the fact that board game cafes are commercial enterprises provides some kind of guarantee that they will make uh, special efforts to be inclusive and welcoming. And because cafes per se are arguably the most universal, omnipresent and uh, culturally familiar type of public place, board game cafes are uh, or can be more appealing to women, families and non-gamers who are looking to try something new, which is why I put board game cafes on a more inclusive end of that spectrum. But the problem of not having company um, to visit a board game cafe really exists, and one participant said um, that he used to live just opposite a board game cafe, um, but because none of his friends was into board games, he never went to that cafe until he found out almost by accident that they have social gaming nights. Um, surprisingly, um, almost every board game cafe has special events, such as D&D nights or occasional uh, playtesting events, but not every board game cafe has social nights targeted at newbies and casual gamers. Uh, on a scale from niche to mainstream, uh, game shops are very much targeted at hobbies, whereas uh, board game cafes often attract those who don't identify as gamers, but are looking for some new leisure experience. Uh, and meetups are somewhere in between. Uh, and in a moment, I will explain why. But there is definitely a slightly dismissive attitude to board game cafes among some hobbyists who prefer to attend meetups. Uh, apparently, they seem to perceive board game cafes as a place for, so to speak, muggles. Um, another interesting thing is the commercial non commercial divide between meetups and uh, board game cafes. Although people attending uh, gaming meetups in pubs, cafes, and community centers are expected to buy drinks and food and sort of justify their presence in the space. Um, and they often end up spending the same amount or even more than they would spend in a board game cafe. Uh, but nevertheless, such meetups are still perceived as non-commercial, presumably because the organizers do not um, make any profit. And it's not uncommon for gamers to visit both. Sorry. Um, to visit both um, board game cafes and um, meetups in non-specialized spaces, both commercial and non-commercial, but, uh, and it may seem slightly counterintuitive, 
meetup organizers are not very keen on um, hosting their meetups at board game cafes. And as one participant explained, that would mean doing their uh, job for them, and that would also mean losing identity. Um, the next factor is location and time. It has a great impact on the balance between inclusion and exclusion. Um, city and town centers tend to have a more diverse audience, uh, including those who are not necessarily interested in games, uh, but are looking for some fun social experience. And as the organizer of a weekly afternoon meetup explained in the quote, for them, board gaming um, becomes part of their day out, which is quite different from a weekend, uh, from a weeknight in a church hall. Uh, and as he explains in the second quote, um, a cafe or pub meetup uh, in the city center feels like a more public, more diverse space with less pressure and commitment. Uh, getting to and from public board gaming spaces in more distant areas can be a problem, both logistically and financially, as this quote illustrates. Uh, and there are also safety concerns that are not always immediately recognized. Uh, one meetup organizer told me that they had a male-dominated uh, organizing group that didn't realize that the venue they initially chose could be a problem until uh, a female co-organizer pointed out that she wouldn't feel safe walking in that area at night. Uh, in terms of layout and design, uh, there are three key topics that keep coming up in the interviews. The first one is visibility. As I already mentioned, uh, there is a persistent narrative of coming out from secluded and marginal spaces into more open ones. And board game cafe owners and customers often mention how big windows make board gaming more appealing and newbie friendly. Uh, meetup organizers certainly have less placemaking power, but um, they often mention that they want to be visible and approachable, uh, even in a space that doesn't belong to them. The second aspect of layout and design is accessibility, and that includes not only disabled access, but also bright colors um, to look less intimidating and to avoid that game shop stigma. Uh, also, signage is very important uh, to assist those who um, struggle with an anxiety uh, and comfortable sitting because game nights take a lot of time. Uh, the third element is quality. And to quote one board game cafe customer, poor design creates uh, what he describes as an off-putting atmosphere that attracts very stereotypically geekly, geeky people uh, who will put up with it and no one else would. Uh, in addition to physical design, hosting has a great impact on the atmosphere. Uh, Meetup attendees often mention how um, being individually greeted by the host makes them feel welcome and comfortable. And the best practice is to continue monitoring and moderation uh, over the course of the entire event. Uh, some meetup organizers put extra emphasis on the importance of inclusive language, which means using preferred pronouns, avoiding in-jokes, uh, required knowledge, uh, sarcasm to support people on the autism spectrum. And the next factor I call games and gamers. Uh, before I started my fieldwork, I had an idea that public board game and spaces bring together um, heavy slash serious gamers and light slash casual ones. But so far, it seems like uh, there is still an invisible boundary between these two groups. And what I found especially interesting is how um, many board game cafe owners and meetup organizers tend to treat heavy gamers as a problematic crowd that needs to be controlled or kept away, um, as you can see in some quotes. Um, so one board game cafe owner said uh, explicitly that they wanted to be um, wanted to avoid being labeled uh, positioned as a hobbyist space. Um, and on the other hand, um, there is an assumption that light slash casual gamers need to be initiated into serious board gaming uh, because light party games are nothing but a filler or a warm up before uh, what they call a proper game. So I'm sure many of you have uh, heard that comment in gaming events. Would you like to play a proper game now? Um, and last but not least, uh, food and drinks. 
for many gamers, food provides emotional support in an environment that can be, in many respects, stressful. Uh, it's also a powerful social lubricant that um, brings strangers together and makes the atmosphere more relaxed and informal. But it's also important to remember that uh, food and especially drinks, especially alcoholic drinks, um, can be an instrument uh, of social and cultural distinction that can favor um, some demographics while excluding others, specifically people who don't drink for cultural or other reasons. Um, so, like I said before, uh, these are just some emerging findings, but hopefully that illustrates uh, how many uh, different and often overlapping and interdependent factors, including uh, type of space, location and time, layout and design, hosting, games and gamers, and food and drinks, shape uh, public board gaming, ambiences and audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra, and a, a huge round of applause for that, that wonderful talk. Um, I have so many questions already for the first two panelists, but we have two more, and and I'm I'm also hanging on to my own. So if you have any questions for Alexandra, please put them in the Q and A, and we will move now to um, Ian Williams at UNC Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina. Uh, Chapel Hill and Sam Tobin at Fitchburg State University in their joint presentation on materiality and sociality in min miniatures wargaming. So I think, Ian, you can put the presentation up whenever you're ready and we'll keep rolling along. Again, if you have questions for Kellen or Alexandra, please put them in the Q&A. And if you want to just say a lot of stuff about it, put it in the Discord panel chat. Thank you. Okay, uh, I am unmuted. Okay, so thank you so much for the introductions. Uh, I'm Ian Williams. Uh, Sam Tobin will be uh, uh, coming in uh, sometimes to speak as well. Um, we're going to talk about tables specifically and wargaming um, and the materiality of tables and uh, their relationship to sociality around wargaming. Um, we're zeroing in on wargaming tables, not board gaming tables or role playing game tables um, for some reasons, which will hopefully become apparent uh, as the presentation goes on. Hey, everybody. Um, we're zeroing in on these kinds of tables as opposed to traditional checkers or chess topped uh, game tables, cocktail cabinets, or even ping pong. Um, they're related to those tables, but they're different. And they're different in that they act as platforms for play, like other game tables, but they also are, through the use of miniatures and terrain, transformed into a part of that gameplay that helps to determine the feel, rules, and tempo of play. We play with them and on them. We're talking about this changes in the size of these tables even more specifically today. And why table size matters for miniature war games is that we use measurement, uh, not grids or abstract spaces to define movement and the relation between miniatures. So table size, battlefield size really, really matters. The distance between miniatures determines the ways in which they interact with each other in terms of things like movement, line of sight, shooting, magic, whatever. Thus, how big a tabletop is changes how play works. So changes to table size changes the games deeply. Just a note on how we're thinking about this sort of in terms of a theoretical context, uh, Jurgen Habermas's structural transformation is, of course, really important here uh, for thinking about the politics and possibilities of the table. This allows us to think about things like different kinds of publics connected to different kinds of contexts and deliberation, and tables is helping to create different kinds of sociality. And for us to ask, what are the politics of these war game tables and what do they constitute and how are they changing? So I want to start with a recent finding. Uh, I've been doing groundwork for an ethnographic study of work and craft in the miniatures wargaming industry in Nottingham, UK, which I visited uh, earlier this month. And there are lots of different companies there, uh, so many in fact that colloquially it's known as the lead belt. And what happens is that aspiring sculptors, artists, and game designers move to Nottingham to work at Games Workshop, which is of course the publisher of the immensely popular Warhammer games. And they stick around for a few years, uh, leave for a variety of reasons, whereupon they work for smaller studios in an area uh, right down to boutique level of like just a couple people or they open up their own companies 
And when I was establishing contacts in the area, there wasn't a single person I chatted with who had not worked at Games Workshop in some capacity over the past 30 to 40 years, right? I had met some old timers as well as new, newer folks. And during an informal meeting with someone who I'm keeping anonymous, uh, the topic of table sizes came up because we feel that they're shrinking. And I expressed my puzzlement at, the, at, at that shrinking standard size of wargaming play areas slash tables. Um, not just in Warhammer, but across several different games. What drove it? Uh, was it some data about declining home ownership rates or average square footage of apartments? And the answer that I received was as simple and even predictable as it was stunning. In just the past few years, Games Workshop's primary games have moved from playing on a very standard across games, for the most part, six by four feet to strange bespoke sizes, 44 by 30 inches or 44 by 60 inches. And this was because they gotten hold of Ikea's data on their most sold tables. And in an effort to expand Warhammer's appeal, they simply reconfigured their play area to roughly match the surface area of those Ikea tables. And again, I wanna reiterate, Wargaming table sizes indeed are shrinking. There's a host of ramifications to this. The material is front and center in miniatures Wargaming, which is not to say that play is immaterial in a board game as an obvious corollary. But with Wargaming, the play area is a table. It is not meant to be portable. The stuff on the table can and does vary widely from game to game. The constraints on play are tied to furniture, to plywood, to foam board, as my table is. The table is both large, it's larger than most board games, and it's still small because it exists within spaces which are not usually dedicated simply to gaming. There are kitchen tables, store tables, domestic spaces, commercial spaces, public spaces, all of which temporarily shed their context to create a space for mock war. It is also the case that Games Workshop's attempt to expand Warhammer's appeal to democratize it after a fashion shines light on enlightenment ideas of the public as theorized by Kant and Habermas. A public bound to such narrow access to a public sphere with access provided by markets is no real public at all. There's also a temporal aspect to the table materiality in war games play as well, obviously. The larger the table, the more time is needed for play, more miniatures fit onto it. The imagination expands to fill the empty space. A six by four table needs to be filled. It becomes a site of mass battle rather than a site for skirmishes. Play changes, design changes. When a designer shrinks the play space, what does that do for such an open medium as miniatures wargaming? Well, you sell fewer miniatures for one because fewer can fit on your table. Games Workshop's answer, again related to me by someone in the know, is to raise the prices per miniature a bit. The smallest game size Games Workshop recommends now, which is of course related to table size, takes an hour to play on a 44 by 30 inch table. And where space is democratized to some extent, time may not be. Not all of us have an hour of spare time for play. Sarah Sharma writes about the uneven distribution and experience of time in her book, In the Meantime. A host of class, gender, and racial factors come into play, not least that where one has free time, it is often unwittingly provided by the denial of free time to someone else. So what we'd like to do now is to create a taxonomy, a table of tables. And a table is not merely a table, it's a relationship. It's a different manner to look through a window than to look at a window in Bill Brown's language. Uh, with that in mind, we'll quickly go through the categories of wargaming tables as we see them. So one of the relationships I find most fascinating is that between club tables and gaming store tables. And fortuitously, uh, Dr. K uh, Kvyat uh, picks up on some of this uh, in her research, which I'm desperate to read. Um, wargaming, wargaming clubs function as public organizations, model long lines similar to your local Elk Lodge. You pay dues, there are elections, a space is rented out temporarily or on a long-term basis for meetings and play. Those dues pay rent and are used to buy tables, make scenery and the like. In store play, you go to a store, usually at a regularly scheduled time, and get a game of Warhammer in. It's usually with strangers or people who are infrequent acquaintances. These different contexts give rise to very different tables. Each style requires a different communicative relationship at that table. Each style funnels players to different types of terrain, different table sizes, different emphases on standardization. Store play must be fair and predictable because it is a game, as said, between strangers or loose acquaintances. The communicative practices likewise become predictable at these tables. They're based on sportsmanship, fairness, predictable modes of play. 
Club play is something I have less direct experience with, but what happens at the club table proceeds from a different type of socialization than store play. A polity is formed, ci civic in nature, when compared to the commercial context of store play. And it's certainly more intimate than store play, but that comes with all the pitfalls, impenetrability, and promises that this fact entails. On to the domestic and to the kitchen table. Uh, the kitchen table is a key table for us as it's the very table type which IKEA makes and Games Workshop uses as a model. We see the domestic spaces uh, more specifically than just the whole home, but spaces in the home which are multi-use or shared or contested. For more on the man cave for a space which is in the home but explicitly not of it, uh, so you can see our next slide, and we don't mean to say that the dining room, the kitchen tables are the same um, or that people have both, I don't. Um, but in these spaces, we see how miniature wargaming for all its intense material footprint and heft uh, is portable, mobile, and is set up and struck all the time. Play itself is long to describe as secondary, as ornamental, uh, from Huizinga on, uh, and as contingent, uh, that it's always ready to be interrupted. The domestic table is a platform for just this sort of play, but it also highlights the way in which the contingent um, miniature play occupies and remakes spaces, even if only temporarily. War games take up space and time, and in this ludic transformation of the domestic, uh, there's a kind of pleasure. Um, we see playing in domestic spaces offer um, these kinds of experiences, primarily the extension of the Baroque material and attendant practices of wargaming and hobbying into this quotidian space, however briefly. So as Sam said, another table is the dedicated gaming table, most often found in game rooms or more gendered and colloquial, the man cave. This is a photo of my main wargaming space at my brother's house. It has a custom built table with an extension and shelves underneath. It's also at about midsection height so as to avoid the terrible wargaming back, which is that persistent ache you get when you're bending down at a 70 degree angle for hours over a shorter table. We affectionately and ironically named it Brolympus, although Brahalla was also in the running, because we are aware of a certain unfairness to its existence and its explicit maleness. It is of the home, but it is not domestic. Again, Sarah Sharma's work is instructive, as is Nicholas Taylor's recent work on gaming rooms. If my gaming group, all men, are able to withdraw from the spatial and temporal demands of domesticity, it is only because someone else, in this case my brother's wife or my wife and daughter, are for some period of time unable to do likewise. There's also a pointed class dimension to the dedicated table. The bounds of what a table might be here are left only to the individual's imagination. It takes money both to get the dedicated space required to create the table or hire someone to create it for you and to get enough terrain to populate it. And I'm not going to lie, but Olympus is impossibly cool and is the fulfillment of something of a lifelong dream for my brother and I, but there's something also almost decadent about its existence. A bit of guilt hangs in the air when we ascend the stairs and play. Part awareness of our maleness being a significant part of our capacity to indulge in such a way at all. Part sheepishness at our working class upbringing, making all of it seem kind of like a dream. The process of building it felt impossibly indulgent. Whether such awareness hangs over others with their own Brolympuses, Brahalas, and Brohimes is ambiguous, but what we can speak to is the totality of the retreat, however temporary it might be. The man cave may have one table, as this one does, or several, but all of them are dedicated. A wargaming table here, painting table there, it is in the full withdrawal from domesticity, its single-use purpose, space, temporality, and table converge in this instance. The table is not simply one thing at a time as with other types, but one thing ever. Moving to the convention and the tournament, the play practices and sociality of these tables are very well, even perhaps overrepresented in war game media, as well as academic research on miniature war gaming. And this has to do with the public nature of this kind of organized play, but also the public nature of the rules, ideas, tensions, and discourse which support and allow tournaments and the out of play systems which they fit into and animate. The terminate tables have much in common with the aforementioned store and club tables. Indeed, stores and clubs may act as organizers or hosts to such events. We break out these terminate tables from club tables due to their transient and yet institutionalized qualities. These are folding tables laid out in rows, in hotel conference rooms, convention centers, student unions. These tables themselves are mobile, folding, even wheeled. Uh, 
And as the miniatures and terrain are brought to them, armies are packed in foam, bravely checked as baggage, shipped ahead of time, wedged into trunks, then unpacked, mended as needed, and placed on decorative display boards, which vary troops about the floor from table to table. Terminate tables are likely to conform to current rules on table size and the rules and implications that follow. They differ in their context and set of rules practices which define that context. Terminant rules are not the rules of the game, but rather the rules for how a series of games and their outcomes relate to each other to produce a particular tournament, which itself increasingly is in turn incorporated, or at least its data is, into a larger systems of players, games, forces, builds, ranking, and meta. This is no imagined community of anonymous players. Terminate tables are above all visible. They are observed in person and remotely by players, onlookers, and officials. The visibility of the tournament table connects it to an intentional economy and to issues of performance and sport, transparency, fairness, and playing with strangers. The games, the miniatures, the army styles and choices all flow from the public visibility of the table at the tournament. And finally, tournament tables spawn their own terms. Top table, that is the final battle at the tournament, uh, and tabled or to be tabled as a verb to remove an opponent's forces from play totally, to wipe them off the table. To be on the table is to be in play, in the running, someone to watch. So in closing, what we've attempted to do here is to account for the table in tabletop wargaming, um, because there's this weird thing where we concentrate a lot, and Sam and I have both done this, concentrate on miniatures, concentrate on play, measurements, and things like that. But the humble table has been weirdly neglected, uh, literally beneath notice. Um, and these tables aren't the end of it. We spoke and got rid of some slides about uh, playing in Iraq on sand, playing on the floor when you're a kid, where those things also become tables. Because again, a table is a relationship. If I pick up a kitchen table and I take it to my bedroom, it's no longer a kitchen table. Just like if you play a war game on your kitchen table, it is temporarily something else. Um, and what we want to start here is a means of thinking about the materiality of war games play, which fundamentally starts with the specificities of the various relationships which make a table a table. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ian and Sam, for a, a riveting uh, talk about tables. I was so busy taking notes that I just I can't uh, I can't see my tables in the same way ever again. A uh, round of applause for them. Our final presenter, um, presenting from the University of Tampere, is uh, Vila Kankainen, um, who will be talking about the material spreadability of tabletop gaming. Again, if you have questions or comments for, for Sam and Ian's presentation, please put them in the Q&A. And otherwise, uh, we'll hear from Vila and then have about uh, 20 minutes for a uh, question and answer period. Hello. Let me just share my screen. Um, I hope you can see it now. Great. Now, so me, it is time. Last conference, I had camera off. But OK, hey. Everybody, I'm Ville Kankainen from uh, Tampere University and uh, from the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. And I'm going to talk about material spreadability of tabletop gaming. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, first a couple of words what is spreadable media? And uh, then uh, what I mean by material spreadability of tabletop gaming and uh, based on some some data and uh, other uh, observations and uh, then uh, some thoughts what to do next or questions uh, so the starting point for uh, all of this is that uh, as we all know, materiality is central for board game enjoyment, like uh, Melissa Rogerson uh, and colleagues have uh, 
shown in their their article and uh and although players of their or hobbyists often uh, say that the materiality is very important for them still internet has an uh, important role in the hobby and uh, sometimes uh, hobbyists use even more time uh, on online in these uh, different practices on a digital hinterland as uh, Melissa and others call it uh, <clears throat> than actually playing and uh, of course there have there have been uh, previous studies uh, on, by Paul Booth on paratextuality transmedia and uh, how this uh, tabletop gaming connects that way to digital digital culture and then Aaron's uh, digital economy and uh, thoughts about analog games as a as a brand that is expressed online and all the, the things that go with it and uh, and uh, I've been I presented on the hybrid media ecosystem in Bigra just a couple of weeks ago some also something that is uh, very much under progress this thinking and yeah as we know well, yeah the materiality digital materiality or materiality in a online environment for tabletop gaming it's presenting for example in crowdfunding their miniatures are very important for the success of the products and so on and and uh And uh, yeah, for the back, uh, background of this uh, talk or these ideas I'm presenting here, uh, these are, this is uh, my ongoing PhD that I'm aiming to, aim to finalize soon, which started in a hybrid social play research project here, and uh, it draws on earlier uh, hybrid play project as well. And uh, so there has been uh, lots of uh, thinking and discussions going on in this kind of heuristic process throughout the years when I participated with this, these projects and uh, also discussing this hybrid or mix of analog and, uh, analog and digital elements in uh, different playful, playful constellations. Uh, and the, the, these thoughts are mainly, mainly grounded uh, on a, online survey that I conducted in 2019 to say for adult board game or tabletop game players with a mix of open and closed questions and uh, uh, here are so, some uh, some uh, data of the of the respondents mostly male as is very common in these surveys and uh, most respondents from Finland and United States, but then there's a collection of other countries as well. And uh, in the survey, I asked uh, the respondents to, to dictate if they feel that they identify with tabletop game hobbyists. So most of them did. And so this is this reflects much of the hobbyist uh, approach to these things. Uh, and uh, spreadable media is a term from uh, from media studies by Henry Jenkins and uh, colleagues, and uh, it is about this participatory ecosystem system of uh, media, and uh, it refers to the how in the current online media ecosystem contents are spreading, and with all these participatory practices of uh, of uh, audiences and uh, and how these all work together together to in this 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 time and age and uh, here I have listed the key statements from the book Spreadable Media uh, about that uh, what how what constitutes a uh, 
spreadable, spreadable media. And uh, I will go through these uh, with some examples from my uh, data and uh, also talking about uh, more generally tabletop gaming at this current time and in online environments. So the, yeah, so the idea is that uh, there are free flow of ideas and uh, interaction between the developers and uh, fans or audiences and uh, lots of different kind of experiences and uh, and so on and uh, yep yeah. and uh, what uh, during this uh, PhD process uh, there have risen some questions uh, that uh, I'm aiming to to or ponder, pondering here, and this is very much work in a, work in progress. So I'm uh, interested in uh, all your feedback and comments on uh, how this uh, framework or conceptualization works. And uh, uh, what I'm uh, say, uh, arguing here that uh, it is the materiality that is actually driving the spreadability of tabletop gaming in online environments, because online seems to be the, the, one of the key things for the spreadability or the popularity of tabletop gaming in this uh, time. It is uh, kind of, uh, although the materiality is, uh, is uh, something that is uh, enjoyed most and uh, highlighted, but still it's the I think it's the online media or and uh, how it uh, highlights that or enforces the materiality through all these uh, activities. Like, uh, for example, there's a picture of uh, from Instagram where it's we lots of content over almost 3 million posts about uh, tab and, uh, tabletop games and uh, you can see all the how it's, of course, just the materiality, but all these paintings, the painted miniatures, and uh, enjoyment of this material aesthetics there that is uh, expressed in these online environments. And uh, yep. This is something that for several respondents uh, was a driving factor for their, for their hobby. And uh, yeah, and in, in tabletop gaming, uh, this is something that I've been thinking about this uh, longing for materiality that uh, kind of spread or some one of the motivations for engaging with that. Uh, material content uh, on times when you cannot play uh, but you can uh, daydream of these material practices this is also something that came in the came up in the research of my colleagues uh Mikko Merilainen and Jaakko Stenroos and Kati Heljakka when they were studying uh, miniaturing miniature wargaming and the, the craft of miniaturing and that is something that uh, the hobby is miniature Two words were, were enjoying the, the or dreaming on thinking, fantasizing what they will do with their miniatures. And this is a similar kind of thing that I think in the online media is used for when we are discussing on gaming and, and uh, sharing all this uh, material grounded experiences and uh, and uh, some of the outcomes or things that are been coming up in in my data are like uh, for example this collective uh, remembering or sharing experiences uh, through these uh, visual stories or at a kind of uh, narratives and such when they are shared with the with, with the group gaming group and such and 
and uh, trying to remember these uh, material encounters of tabletop gaming together. And uh, all this kind of sharing of these material experiences, expressing the, the analog brand identity and as a kind of a counterculture to the digitalization and all this, uh, what the, when this materiality is uh, present in online media, it makes the materiality even more relevant than it would be without expressing it in online media. There's this uh, interesting uh, contrast or such there. And uh, as promised, I will uh, talk this, uh, some of these uh, key tenets from the spreadable media book uh, and uh, with uh, some excerpts from the, my data, uh, the flow of ideas in, in uh, that uh, spreads online and uh, for some aspect that it, uh, it uh, imposes this materiality of uh, tabletop gaming is, for example, the, the practice sharing of practices, tips and tricks uh, for miniature crafting and such, or game design, and uh, and then creating creating new games and so on, and. Uh, this is like uh, people are coming up with new kind of material practices through this uh, and, uh, and, and enforcing that part. Uh, the dispersed material, how it is, uh, but the material in online world is uh, dispersed in different uh, places. So you can find different elements of the hobby as a kind of assemblage of uh, tabletop gaming hobby as an assemblage of activities that where you can uh, participate discussions uh, reviewing the material games a way to 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 influence other people friends and uh, your connections in communities what kind of games they can but will buy because lots of uh, respondents also said that uh, that uh, they're not usually buying new games without go going through reviews and so on. And uh, this guy there for of course yeah board game geek it came up as a very popular place for the respondent as uh, lots of them were acquired from there. But there were this, this person of using different kind of services for different elements in the hobby, like uh, having some, some like uh, creative discussions in certain forums and uh, then sharing images in another one or, or looking for, for game experiences of others and so on. And uh, the, the diversified experiences uh, that uh, the spreadability uh, facilitates in tabletop gaming is that one important element was that uh, as uh, people have now more access to the other variety and different kind of game experiences, it also fuels the the hobby so they can focus on more niche aspects of tabletop gaming that they maybe couldn't when they are on ge geographically or otherwise in positions or places where they, they couldn't access certain types of games and so on. So that is also one, one element that you can people can now choose uh, to be more selective on the types of uh, tabletop gaming experiences they want to have, and maybe also only only engaging with uh, that kind of content. 
at this point, I'd like to uh, come in as the moderator and and say that that this uh, okay. presentation can then get, can wrap up and we will get to the the Q and A. Again, we are ruthless moderators in the space, so uh, everyone yes, around applause for Vila. No, it's it's okay. There's no shame. It's just we just enter it right at 15 minutes, and that's not what we do. Thank you so much for your commentary. Yeah, thank you. We'll now uh, now move to the the question and answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our key takeaways. That's what we we can celebrate. Okay. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And 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 uh, we, we I might ask you a question about what your key takeaways are. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we get the the. the, the I'm sorry for right. taking. Let's no no it. worries. Like I said, no, no shame, no worries. Uh, so we'll take down your your slides, and then we'll yes. we'll come into a few. So again, all, if all pre presenters could turn on their video, uh, we will then move into the Q and A. Um, I'm going to ask at least a couple of questions and then move into uh, the Q&A that I have here. If you're doing questions and answers over in Discord, it's likely I won't see them. So if you have one that's urgent Discord, put it in the Q&A here and I can bring it into the conversation. Um, the uh, one one thing that that's, that's very common between the different um, uh, papers actually it, it, it was something that was mentioned in Vila's talk, which is um, uh, images and bodies, right? It, it really does matter what what images of gaming, what what, what we see as our standard uh, view of a gamer and and what it is they are doing and uh, and and what are the bodies that occupy those spaces. Um, in particular, Kellen mentioned, uh, the notion of privacy um, and and the uh, state orchestration of lives. I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, how then these studio spaces, which are again creating this kind of uh, aural and um, visual fantasy space, are also part of what you mentioned earlier as a very orchestrated uh, st state. Are they expressions of some sort of um, larger uh, state or other ideology, or is there something uh, subversive even about these spaces? What's what's going on there? Um, and, uh, and 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 I think then then the overarching connecting question is, um, you know, what is the role of privacy and the private versus the public here? And uh, here I'm referring to uh, Kashana Gray's research, especially on the importance of 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 black bodies, black voices, uh, and even we know you turn your mic on and off in online gaming that then shifts into this kind of space. So uh, yeah, so so I guess my my first question very directly will be um, for all panelists. Um, you know what what is the image of gaming that you're discussing, and maybe what um, <laughs> you know what what can we do to uh you know maybe adjust that or or interrogate that and then finally um what is the notion of the public and the private uh especially with regards to the state uh, and the state's intervention into um any of your your research so anyone can begin but uh, we'll default with kellen if you if you're ready Uh, thank you for the questions, which I think are really interesting to, to chew through. Um, I think that some of the work that I did uh, echoes Alexandra's work because in many of the more public spaces, like the non-enclosed uh, board game shops, you would see a lot more men. Um, in these spaces, you wouldn't really see a diverse range of, say, men and women or people of different ethnicities or people of different, say, um, gender or sexual orientations or identities because they tend, it tends to be a more homogenous public space. And I think that kind of reinforces um, the image of that community as being belonging to one particular kind of person. Um, I do find with the private studio spaces, they do tend to invite um, connections between people who tend to be a bit more diverse in terms of their experiences with the game, just because of the way that it... Um, is able to invite that kind of intimacy, I suppose, the, 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 the fact that you are not seen, you are not visible as a body, I think can be very intimate. But at the same time, even it, it doesn't mean that you are siloed into these uh, groups that don't ever see each other, because even within the studio, you have several groups that play and they intersect and they create their own community. So um, the privacy of that space does, I think, engender greater diversity. 
uh, I'll leave space for others to to answer, but I'll I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Kellen. Um, I think Alexandra, you're next. Um, so yeah, the concept of public. I think it's incredibly complex and. Um, how I understand public in this study is everything is that is not um, someone's home space or workspace. So uh, a place where pretty much everyone can, um, um, a place that pretty much everyone can become part of. And I was thinking whether I should include university board game societies or not, but I think not because you have to be part of that. You have to be a student basically um, to become part of that society. And I, um, so one of the participants, when uh, when he compared a church hall, which seems like a really uh, accessible public space and you don't need to pay anything to uh, attend one of those events. So when he compared that to uh, a city center coffee house, he called the coffee house a public space. So I guess that means more diversity um, and he probably meant that it's a more inclusive space. Um, and I think another aspect is that in a public board game in space, you play with strangers. Uh, so there is always this um, more public rather than private or parochial um, makeup of the audience. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think I think again the opening salvo of the public is an incredibly important and complicated yeah. uh, question. I think you know is something that we haven't reckoned very much with 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 analog gaming, and that these presentations are, are mm -hmm. addressing it directly. I really appreciate that, uh, Sam and Ian. Um, so, like, I actually had a digression, which which we had to strike for time, but I think it was an important one because uh, uh, it was it was very in keeping with Alexandra's research, which is um, we don't really have a conception of the you know kind of like a real public space in the United States anymore, right? Like, you go to it like the place where you game is a gaming store, and during this pilot study I was doing in Nottingham, you know, I was speaking to all of these like miniatures game designers, war game makers, and stuff like that, and like when I told them that all gaming happens at stores they were legitimately like confused and a little freaked out by this because most war gaming in the uk or at least a significant chunk of it of course they have gaming stores happens at these war gaming clubs right where it, they're like little civic organizations um so there's like this wide variety of context there um uh, and, and and sam can elaborate some as well, but what I think uh, uh, happens is I think that like maybe the better question is what do we want out of our publics, right? Because you know I wanted to kind of invoke invoke uh, Nate and Kluga as well on uh, you know their their rejoinder the proletariat public sphere, which was like look if your public sphere is based on markets and market access and stuff like that, it's not a very good public sphere at all. Right. So what you have to do is you have to think of like different modes of engaging uh, with one another in public spaces. I'll see if Sam wants to say something to that as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a good answer because I don't think there, there really is, is a good answer, right? But I really appreciate um, how Alexandra and Kellen brought in the voice of people, how they think about these terms rather than how we think about these terms. Like what ultimately matters is how people understand the public in the context of for a game store, for instance. And by, by parsing that language, we can then apply a kind of a critical cast to it. But it's really interesting to hear that public starts to equal like welcoming to some degree, right? Uh, safety, all these things that are like really valuable. And so for Ian to say, we don't have a public anymore. And as I talking to Ian said, we never did, right? In, in the US means there is no space that is welcoming unless it's a, a commercial, right? Um, and so the flip of that might be, and I'm thinking about the state here, right, is, is what would, there's another public, right? And I, I'm thinking about like the loans that the US government gave to businesses during the pandemic, right? And, um, you know, I used to do a lot of work in arcades. And one of the questions I had, I tried, I couldn't track down the information is, did arcades and game stores get get uh, PPP loans, right? Did they get COVID loans to, to stay open or stay afloat because they couldn't be open? And, to, and what Ian needs to find out when he goes back to Nottingham is like, does Nottingham offer grants and tax incentives for uh, war game designers, right? Like, is this a, a state public? 
in that sense? Is this about businesses? Is this about uh, support um, for specific industries in the same way Hollywood might function or, or other kind of creative class uh, industries could work? That would be an interesting thing to know more about. And since Nick and Kluge and Habermas were all brought in, I'm a Germanist, I should also say that, that uh, Kluge and Habermas in particular are problematic right now thanks to their support for a peace in between Ukraine and Russia. And so then we have to sort of think of what is the public that they are protecting by such a peace uh, with in, in, in this conflict, right? So, so a lot of things have been upended, at least in the German intellectual scene, about this very notion of, you know, the European democracy in public based on uh, uh, very concrete geopolitics of appeasement and warfare right now. So, so yeah, the, the, these questions, why we, they seem to be about, about tabletop gaming, but they are, of course, about everything. Um, they, I, uh, I'm going to give Vila also space, uh, not only to talk about uh, public and pri public and private, but also to say, you know, uh, here are also my conclusions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, one thing about uh, the, the public uh, tabletop gaming, at least. Uh, to mention is that here in Finland, for example, public libraries has had a, have quite a large collections of uh, board games that you can well either play in pair or uh, loan to home. So there is uh, definitely in uh, our society this kind of uh, openness to that, and of course the board game cafes and such. Well, yeah, like I said that uh, they they yeah. Are they, yeah, that public and private companies anyway? But, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't, yeah, okay, that's <laughs> my comment to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, to throw up uh, our question from Percival Hornack, uh, which is, um, which, which I'll read aloud, is prompted by Kellen's presentation, but potentially open to others. How can we reckon with the potential financial inaccessibility of certain spaces of play, particularly ones that employ high production value supplies that cost money? What might be a way to strike a balance there? For me, as a game designer, I'm dealing with this question right now because you know it's going to take a, a lot of resources to make, say, an $80 or $100 board game. That's just going to be how much it will cost. And how do I then make a version that is financial financially accessible or is it you know what what is the cost and benefit of that so uh, those of us who are in, in the industry are directly uh, having to deal with this very question who can play and what's the financial barrier to that any any person can can take this up um i think for me what i've seen is that this reflects the kind of broader player base where you have older players who are coming back into the game uh, because this is stuff that they played in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s growing up. And so they are generally financially stable adults who can afford um, paying 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks for a game and they don't flinch at that. Um, so it, it kind of uh, reflects that. But also people tend to, people who come to um, role-playing game studios to play these games will compare the experiences to going for a yoga class, um, going for a pottery class, going for a like a hand rock tufting class. Yeah, so it's, it's really seen along that spectrum of experiences, of aesthetic or hobbyist experiences. Um, they don't come into it as gamers. So for them, the price tag is very normal. They have not seen different kinds of pricing for that kind of game. So again, I think it's the expansion of that play culture and the way that it's involved or um, pulled in people who wouldn't identify themselves as gamers. So I have people who look at me and say, I wasn't a nerd growing up, so I don't know what I'm doing here, right? And that reflects their expectations and what they would play. Um, so in terms of accessibility, I do think that it is a barrier, but it is not, um, in Singapore at least, it is not prohibitive for now, yeah. Excellent, other, other speakers on uh, the financial barriers uh, to, to play? Um, there might I, be a, oh, a, go, go ahead, Sam. A, this is, by the way, we're working with you and it's like, um, there, there might be a way in which like that financial barrier sounds high if you play games a lot, 
which means that you have a life in which you can play games a lot. And there's sort of a thing older people here will recognize where as I have more money, I have less time. And so like $20 to play a game is no big deal because I'm gonna do it once a year. Uh, whereas if you're like playing in a campaign two times a week, that's a lot of money. And I think this, this time and money thing, well, obviously people have talked about that, but there's something, there's something about leisure that's really important and free time or lack thereof. Yeah, I, I appreciate the connection of, of of time specifically to to space and materiality. Not only you know with your your tables discussion, but also um, you know with with you know the the the, I, the club versus the convention versus the home, um, all of which are extremely um, uh, different spaces in terms of social affordances. Require different tables, and for thus again those of us who are in design, completely different games, right? Completely different uh, 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 sorts of of games and play experiences. Lila, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I can uh, continue. Of course, the yeah the libraries allow, of course, uh, lower the barriers quite a lot. But like uh, we got. Thinking from the, the spreadability point of view, there is at least one important thing is that there's so much more to enjoy in a table of gaming than just playing when people can can just uh, enjoy watching uh, these uh, let's play videos and such, or just like uh, engaging with this kind of con uh, table of gaming content online, which uh, makes the, I think the barrier much lower. But also one thing is that uh, as it is uh, so much easier to actually choose the games based on reviews and such, so you can you don't need to actually buy games just to test them out. That you can have these created experiences, and it's easier to create what kind of games actually they acquire. So I think that it, that can contribute to the lowering of uh, of this barrier to to play as well. Um, I was just going to add, uh, like Sam said, I think something very similar to what I wanted to say, but I also want to kind of like throw in the idea of like production uh, and labor into this, because if you have ever taken uh, a look behind the scenes of you know, role playing game uh, revenue. Uh, you know, if you've ever designed a game and it's on drive through or something like that, like you know that um, it, it's not very lucrative, um, and it becomes incredibly difficult to gauge exactly how much you should charge for a game for, for for a game. Just not just in terms of accessibility, but how you can actually feed yourself, particularly in the collapse of like you know the non Watsy waged kind of structure of game design that you had in like the '90s and the early aughts. Um, so that becomes, you know, another thing, which is, uh, you know, you have to be accessible, but also like those, those margins are incredibly thin. Uh, and where do those two things collide? Yeah, I, I think the, um, you know, the, 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 the question of capital, you know, is, is not, is not just about, okay, what business models, um, you know, are, are we able to use to, to, to do X, Y, and Z, but about around the, you know, the, the whole creation of subjects. And, and it's very, it's a very uncomfortable uh, question for us because we like to think we're free thinking beings and, and are able to make whatever choices. And actually these, these, these business models uh, seem to be much larger than all of us um, to some, some degree, which again is why it's sort of the logistics fiasco and, and analog gaming and, and all these different proliferation of spaces is crucially important for us to look at where the future of the hobby is, as well as uh, how we can, what, what relevant lessons we can glean from its past. Um, does anyone have any final comments we have in our last two minutes before we uh, wrap this up and take a half hour break before our keynote? Only, only for me, that is the sign of a good panel when all four things like dovetail so nicely. That's it. Yeah, it, 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 well, again, the, this panel was primarily formed out of Eastern time zone and European considerations, and the topic itself uh, <laughs> became actually, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, so organically fused, you know, through the presentation. So, what was on, uh, you know, a pat on the back to, to the organizing committee for for getting this done.
All right, thanks so much. And uh, I, I appreciate all of the, the presentations. If you have more questions and commentary, please do visit us on the Discord and go under the panel one thread where there's a remarkable discussion happening ongoing about this material. It could go on for weeks. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we, we are extremely grateful for all of your, your contributions today, panelists. Uh, thanks also to the organizing committee for, for sticking with us. And we'll see everyone in a half an hour for Anna Vesterling's keynote. Take care, everyone.